Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. We'll get that down by Pentecost, I promise. You may or may not have noticed that the last three of the last four weeks, we've sung Psalm 118 as our responsorial psalm. It's actually the most often quoted psalm in the New Testament. The verse we use today for the response, the stone rejected by the builders has become the cornerstone. It's used five times by Christ and by Peter, as we heard in the the first reading, referring to Christ. But I think sometimes we we underappreciate the psalms. Sometimes we use the responsible psalm as sort of like the halftime break for the liturgy of the word, where we can think about, you know, the groceries we have to get after Mass, if that's not what you use the homily for, maybe. But the Psalms, they're the, the official prayer book of the, the Judean Christian faith. And if you think about it, God the Son, Jesus Christ, daily prayed these Psalms, these words that were inspired by God the Holy Spirit, and he prayed them to God his Father. They're very Trinitarian that way. They're the, the prayers that are on the heart of Christ himself. And so, since they're the prayers that God himself wrote and that God loves to hear, I would just encourage you maybe to, uh, to make sure that a day doesn't go by in which we don't pray at least one psalm. They're, they're the official prayers for us. That's why the, the church prays the liturgy of the hours. Every day we pray a number of psalms. I don't know if you have that, the little Magnificat, that little booklet that has psalms for each day as well. But hopefully to add your appreciation to the psalms, I wanted to sort of walk through Psalm 118, this amazing psalm with you today. Just why we use it all the time during, um, during these Easter days. And unfortunately, unfortunately none of us bring our Bibles to Mass. Uh, that'd be cool if we did. But uh, the, only, the closest thing I could find was in this blue book. Numbers 95 and 96 have part of the psalm on it, if you wanted to follow along a little bit. But... But a little background to this psalm, Psalm 118. It was used for the big celebrations for the Jews. They would use it um, when they were processing to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. They would use it for the Passover meal itself and for some of the other big feasts that they would go to Jerusalem for. And so it literally starts out with the word Eucharist, meaning give thanks. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His hesed endures forever. I preached a couple weeks ago about his hesed. His hesed, that's one of those... It's probably the most important Hebrew word in the Old Testament, and it means God's God's faithfulness to the covenant, God's steadfast loyalty to the keeping his covenantal promises. That's what endures forever. He always keeps true to his covenantal word. And then it goes on to this this beautiful, like, back and forth chant. You can think of it as if you went to a football game, and if the cheerleaders started off and they yelled, we are, everyone would respond, Penn State, right? We are Penn, okay, maybe not. But... The, the psalm starts off in a similar way. It says, let all, let all the house of Israel say, they all respond, his, his love endures forever, his hesed endures forever. And it's like all the house of Aaron say, all the priests say, his hesed endures forever, his steadfastness. And then it's let all those who fear the Lord say, and everyone jumps in, his love endures forever. And then, so it starts this, with this beautiful chant back and forth as they're going, as they're pilgrimaging, as they're walking to Jerusalem. And then after the people are fired up for, for God's hesed, then it goes into the, the individual psalmist, um, his testimony as to how God has been faithful to the covenant. Why are we giving him thanks? And so remember that this prayer was chanted not just as they went into Jerusalem, but it was also chanted at the Passover. And so if you remember in the Gospels, at the end of the Last Supper, it says they left the Last Supper singing songs. This was the last song they would have been singing as they were going to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's what we call the Hallel Psalms. Psalm 18 is the last one. And so as Jesus himself is going into the Garden of Gethsemane, these are the words that he was praying. In danger I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is with me, I am not afraid. What can man do against me? The Lord is with me as my helper. I shall look in triumph on my foes. Now, this was the prayer that was on the heart of Christ in the garden. And you can almost see how he, how he received the strength to make that beautiful cry, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Now this was, we have to remember, it was originally the cry of the Israelites. The Israelites were being swarmed and attacked by the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They were constantly being attacked. 
and then it only finds its fulfillment in Christ. And so they, they, the psalm continues, you know, all the nations surrounded me, but in the Lord's name I crushed them. They surrounded me on every side, and in the Lord's name I crushed them. They surrounded me like bees. They burned like fire among thorns, but in the Lord's name I crushed them. It's like a song of great thanksgiving for what they've done. And then it goes, on, my Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my savior. The Lord has become my savior. In the Hebrew it says, the Lord has become Yeshua. The Lord has become Jesus. And then the psalmist speaks again about God's right hand. And when, the, when it talks about God's right hand, it means the work of God in the world. And it says, the right hand of the Lord has become my salvation. The right hand of the Lord, what he does in the world, has become Yeshua, has become Jesus. Hopefully that gives new meaning to then the, the next phrase. It says, the right hand of the Lord, Yeshua, has been raised. This is why we sing this psalm on Easter Sunday. And then it goes on, the psalmist cries out, I shall not die now, but now I shall live, because the right hand of the Lord has been raised. And then with verse 19, there's this great shift in tone. So it starts off the psalm with that great introduction, that acclamation of praise, and then it goes into the psalmist's testimony of why we're giving thanks, of how the Lord has been faithful. And then it goes into, because of how the Lord has blessed this one, how all the people have been blessed. Now it talks about his, that, that enduring covenantal faithfulness. So you've got to put yourself back on the road to Jerusalem. And so as these pilgrims were going to Jerusalem, they're singing this song. The next line is, open to me the gates of righteousness, I will enter and thank the Lord. Now remember, Jerusalem was built on a hilltop, and around Jerusalem was a wall. And in each wall, each of the four sides of the wall was a gate. So as they're going through this gate, they're praying, Lord, open to me now this gate. Because they're going into the city in which they can now have a relationship again with God. The city that was conquered and from which they were exiled, they can now enter back into, and back into that relationship. And then it goes into um, that famous verse that we use today for a refrain. You know, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. Now the cornerstone, another name for it is what we call the keystone, which being from Pennsylvania, we should all know what the keystone is. You know, as they were going through the gate, the gate is an archway, and on the top of that arch there's a special stone, and that special stone keeps all the other stones in place from falling in on themselves. And when the builders were putting together this archway, they would literally find stones that were unfit for that keystone position, and they would roll them down the hill into the valley. And so as the Jews were processing into Jerusalem, they would pass these rejected stones and they would recall that they themselves once were the rejected people. But now they have been placed in the highest of positions. They have now become a source of blessing for all people. The Israelites were the first cornerstone rejected that have become, the, uh, that have become now the cornerstone. And that's only brought to fulfillment in Christ. Because, no longer, because in Christ, you know, in the, no longer are we going into a city, an earthly city, in which we can have that relationship again. But now in Christ we go into a heavenly city. And he's now the gate. He's the cornerstone. He's the city in which we now have that relationship with our Lord and God. And so then the, the next verse is the one that we use on Easter Sunday. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And then as the pilgrims in Jerusalem, as they went through that gate, then the people that were already in the city began to sing the psalm back to them. And the very next line is, Lord, grant salvation. In Hebrew, Lord, Hosanna. And then it continues, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Join in procession with leafy branches up to the altar. So if you ever wondered on Palm Sunday how everyone knew what to say and how they all showed up with palms, it's because this is what they did every single year at Passover. This is the psalm they were chanting, Hosanna, Blessed is you comes in the name of the Lord, and they all have leafy branches. And this is a psalm, this is the part of the psalm that we actually sing every single day at Mass during the Holy, Holy, Holy. And so the psalm ends, the people are going up to the altar to give thanks. Literally, they go up to the altar to Eucharist, to give thanks. And so nothing, the, the last line is the same as the first line. 
Um, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His hesed, his covenantal lo- and loyalty endures forever. It's the most beautiful, it's one of the most beautiful psalms. It's not even my favorite, but it's one of the most beautiful psalms. So my encouragement to you is don't let a day go by in which we don't take at least one psalm and offer it to our Heavenly Father. There are psalms for every spiritual, emotional, psychological need that you can imagine. It's 150 of them, every purpose. Remember, part of being like Jesus is to pray like Jesus. And these are the prayers that were on his own sacred heart that he offered in the Holy Spirit to his Heavenly Father. To become like Jesus, we should pray like Jesus.